uh, the opportunity to, we would always want to bring crew members to actually meet the family. Uh, and that's when they would throw these like breakfasts or lunches. We had a, a boxing day when a bunch of my friends from USC actually went to the gym and we all were trained by Maryland and her dad of how to, how to box. And then we sparred against each other too, which is when you fight against each other. And uh, I was set up against Maryland actually. And I fought Maryland. And um, I, there's a picture of me like laying down on the ground and her looking over me and then the dad taking a video of it and laughing. And that's just, I feel like that's just how it was for the whole set. Like, I'm so happy that you all could, or a lot of you could feel it on the screen of that camaraderie and that closeness because that's how it felt behind the scenes as well. So um, we're just really grateful to be part of that. I do just wanna say it was very clear that there was a tremendous amount of trust between Maryland and her family and your team. And I think that really resonated on the screen. Um, so just kudos for that. Cause I think it made your film sing. Um, for me, Fighter being like my family um, was tricky because my parents have always been my biggest supporters um, being in film. So they wanted me to make the best film possible. And that made it, I think, difficult to capture authenticity sometimes because they wanted to give me the best film. Um, so I think that was kind of the trickiest part, um, but there were many, many tricky parts to be quite honest. Um, but also being my family, it's like, you know, you're airing your dirty laundry in front of, you know, theaters full of people. Um, and that can, that can be really challenging sometimes. So, but I think it was, it was a learning process uh, for everyone, for our crew, uh, for my family. And I also think my family, um, we've always been extremely close and there's always been a level of, really, really open communication. So I think as we were going through the shooting process that they kind of relaxed and they got more comfortable. And that was really helpful for me. And also just working, it was really hard to make a film about my own family. So having a team that I really trusted, um, you know, eight of my favorite people in the world were on this set with me. They lived in my parents' house for a week. You know, they had meals with my family. They really bonded with my parents and with my brothers. I actually have two brothers, despite what it looks like in the film. Um, and I think that made it really helpful to kind of have my parents open up and feel more comfortable and feel like they were just chatting with us as opposed to, you know, helping their daughter graduate. So um, I think that was a really important part of the process uh, for us. And I'm, I'm really glad that my family trusted me enough to put this story out into the world. Um, I think for us, uh, kind of similar to Maryland. So we we all flew to North Carolina and our whole crew came with us. Um, but that was the first time we'd ever met the family. And pretty much as soon as we got there, we were like, OK, we're going to start rolling camera on you if that's OK. Um, but luckily, I think Davis, especially our seven year old was um, kind of he really led the charge in terms of like he had no barrier with us. It was the minute we were at his doorstep. He was he was best friends with us. Um, I think one of the, in terms of like the theme of family, I think one of the most interesting and really one of the most powerful things that we learned while we were there is that every member of this family is impacted by Davis's disease, even, even like their youngest daughter, who's four. Um, but for example, when Davis has a seizure, uh, his older brother Jackson will take care of the younger sister. And I mean, for someone of Jackson's age, he's seen a lot more than probably most of us could imagine, um, <clears throat> which has consequently made him seem a lot older than he actually is. Um, but I think as filmmakers, it was just really powerful to witness as a family, how they came together for, for their child and um, how it changed their lives on the daily. Yeah, no, um, it was really interesting because there's a lot of stuff that's cut out of the final doc, but um, Ashley, um, the Davis's mother, talks a lot about kind of like, yeah, the system that they have when, you know, Davis kind of uh, either undergoes a seizure or um, one of the symptoms really acts up. And that stuff was just really heavy. Um, it eventually got down to a point where when we were um, editing, we were just like constantly considering, you know, like 
stuff that we wish we could have included, but we just necessarily didn't have the footage to support it. Like one of the major things was um, when Davis like does have an episode, um, they actually have oxygen tanks underneath his bed and Ashley would be responsible for pulling them out and just making sure that he has like, you know, steady flow of oxygen uh, before the EMT arrives. And Jackson talks a little bit about that in his interview and that it's, it's like, it's funny because when we were interviewing Jackson, he was in his like skeleton PJs and he's playing with a Nerf gun. And honestly, I would say half that interview is him like breaking down like the intricacies of like these Nerf guns and his like whole entire armory that he had. Um, but he's also talking about like his, you know, youngest brother. He's also the oldest, which is, you know, a whole different dynamic, but he's also talking about like, you know, his brother, obviously going through this really, like, at least for me, I would imagine like a really traumatic episode. And um, there's like definitely this sense of levity from, you know, like, you know, the circumstances like I'm talking about, but it's definitely just really heavy to think about. Yeah, this like really young kid having to deal with this responsibility and him understanding his role in it. Um, yeah, it's just like all the kids were really amazing. Um, especially just seeing how they interacted with Davis. It's just really interesting to see kind of the kid's perspective of that, but yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure if this is gonna turn into a question, but I wanna say thank you for both for sharing that, or all three. I, I think one thing that I found, I find very interesting just hearing all these stories is like there's a, with family comes like shared trauma as well. And I think they all have your family, Davis's family, maybe especially our families too, like, it's interesting to see how that's an integral part of getting past like really tough experiences is by like working together and uh that's very special i feel i feel like we were very lucky to to be part of telling something so important and being able to showcase like resilient people uh yeah i just wanted to like acknowledge that absolutely and i think i think kind of building off of that what was really tremendous about both your stories is the siblings um, and the trust that you gained from the siblings who are understandably probably very protective of their, you know, brother or sister, um, was that very obvious right off the bat for both of you? Like, is that, I'm just curious about the difference between like working with the siblings of the protagonist and then also the protagonist. If anyone wants to answer. I, I think for us, um, it was interesting because like I I think we both wanted Davis to feel like a movie star and we would constantly tell him that like you're the star of this production you know you can like take a break if you want if you need someone to bring you a snack or bring you a snack don't worry yeah. about it um, <laughs> but with that obviously you don't want to make his siblings feel excluded so yeah we also put in the effort to make like all the kids feel comfortable by being like yeah this is a real Hollywood production you're part of right now <laughs> um, but yeah uh, but with that came like because we did um, separate interviews with, you know, like like Davis had like kind of his coverage, uh, but then we'd always pull Jackson aside away from the other kids to like interview him. And then we pulled Alex Kate aside to interview her. Alex Kate actually gave us a tour of the house, um, which there was a lot of funny stuff, but yeah, none of it was really relevant to anything. <laughs> but you, you know, cause it's a kid, but um, yeah, no, uh, it was just interesting. Yeah, once again, like gauging kind of, I guess the level of like understanding because like I said Jackson's like very aware he's the eldest he knows his responsibilities um Alex Kate is also aware um but I'd say she's less like I guess um she didn't like I think had trouble like kind of communicating what that feeling was you know especially kind of like doing this stuff like I she definitely knows that you know like Davis is not like other kids and um, their dad, Dana, was like, yeah, no, Alex Kate will fight anyone who messes with Davis. And just after you yeah, spending time with her, we're like, absolutely, Alex Kate will fight anyone who messes with their brother. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's just, once again, getting that, like, um, that beautiful perspective of like how they interpret these things and how they explain it to us. It's like really interesting. I think too, with, so Alex Kate, she's, she was four when we shot and I'm sure it's similar. I'm I'm curious for Marilyn too, because I know she has like a younger sister, but it's really interesting with Alex Kate is you can 
in a few years, it'll be interesting to see how, because Davis experiences a lot of developmental delays, like how she, her developmental capacities compare to his and already she speaks a lot more fluidly than he does on occasion. So, but currently when she's four, she doesn't necessarily re realize that and he doesn't have full awareness of that either at seven, but as they age, eventually they're both gonna become more aware of those um, developmental disparities between the two of them. So. Um, I think for both of us, we would love to just see how the family progresses in a few years. And um, but overall, they're they're huge advocates for each other on every level, which is really amazing. That's so interesting that you talked about the de developmental disparities because with Marilyn. So again, we're talking about Team Marilyn, and uh, she has a younger sister named Georgette, and she ends up being like the comedy relief of the entire movie, <laughs> grabbing chips, running away. Uh, defending her dad from Marilyn punching him and um it's it's interesting you say that because Marilyn like for her story she actually of course like lost her memory through an unknown virus uh lost all her motor function I see you returning it um and uh she actually had to read like a lot of Georgette's books and uh that's how she started like getting her memory back was like actually like being with her younger sister like that um, the crazy thing too is the parents thought Marilyn was that she was going to pass away. They they really did believe it got to the point where, and it's not included in the film, but it got to the point where Marilyn's condition was getting so bad that uh, they decided to have another kid because they thought Marilyn was going to pass away. Wow. And the dad actually went to church and he prayed and, and he was like, "I have no like I'm at I'm at rock bottom. My family like we don't know what's going on and like." God, like, what's, what can we do? And he felt like it was time to like have another child. And uh, so they made that decision and uh, yeah, Marilyn ended up getting better maybe because of Georgette in a way where she could have some of the, the same teachings of like what it's like to raise a, as an infant. Um, and I just love Marilyn so much because like seeing her as an older sister uh it really inspired me because I was I'm the youngest of seven kids and I was you know my siblings played a huge part in raising me because we had a single mom and uh when I was there filming Marilyn it really felt like I was filming my sisters taking care of me uh, not saying I'm Georgette I'm not that cool yet but uh it really it was beautiful seeing that uh that dynamic of what it's like to be an older sibling I turned it off for a second. Hello again. Um, wow. So a lot of heavy stuff that comes up, like the heaviness that is shared, you know, amongst families and that you all got to, you know, kind of carry for a little bit while, while you were with them. Um, so I guess I'm curious about, you know, like how long did you spend with these families and, you know, what um, means did you go about um, navigating, you know, these really difficult topics with them? Sure. <laughs> I, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we can start at the end, maybe, if you guys want, because we've been kind of going this way. Yeah. Um, we had about a weekend with the family. It was very, very quick. Um, we found out about the project probably about a week and a half before we actually shot it, um, which um, we, we got an email from our producers and we were like, yeah, absolutely. And then before we flew to North Carolina, we hopped on a Zoom call with Ashley, the mom. Um, for about like half an hour, an hour, just to be like, here's who we are. Here's kind of what we're thinking, just to hopefully put our mind at ease a bit. Um, but then we landed on a Friday, like first. Our camera crew wasn't there yet, um, but we had like our own little camera and we took it to the. Um, that was um, and kept our camera on them just so that they could kind of get used to it. And um, we let Davis hold the camera for a bit just so he could kind of be like, wow, this is really cool. Um, but then we didn't actually start rolling material that was used for the doc until the next day. So Saturday and Sunday. Um, so it was, it was very quick, but um, yeah, luckily they got over the hurdle of having cameras in their space very quickly. We like built a relationship with the family in like real time and that weekend, I think both Claire and I said it's like one of probably the best weekends we've ever spent just because like, um, yeah, no, the family was really welcoming and warm and 
that <laughs> it's not included, but for the stuff that we shot on the beach, um, literally like, I think like in between shots, Claire and I were like in our bathing suits with the kids on the beach. Yeah, and I was swimming with them and like literally holding them above our head just because like waves just kept crashing and like tape just kept knocked down. <laughs> I also had like a moonlight moment where I was like holding it in the water. <laughs> oh, no. I know. That's and that was fun. not to get like, like, I don't know, personal, but I was definitely like doing this with him. I was like, yeah, I could imagine being a dad one day. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so, yeah, no, I think we're incredibly lucky to have gotten what we got like in this crazy short amount of time. That's an amazing congratulations um <laughs> yeah. i love you, you go. <laughs> um so for me i mean we shot with my family for a week but of course i had been with them for a lifetime um but that uh that complicated things because then we only had a week to completely deconstruct you know 23 years of history um with my family uh, for me. And I think, um, I think it was interesting also like scheduling things like, you know, texting my mom, okay, um, we're going to take apart your living room and interview you on Tuesday morning. So we need you to, you know, take off work and, uh, you know, all this stuff. And, um, but I think, um, I think we got what we needed in that, in that week. And I think what really helped was that, my parents would, um, like I said, we were, we were tearing apart their living room. Um, so, and we had like big, big flags, big lights, big, all this stuff that they hadn't seen because they'd never come to see me at school or anything. So we let them just kind of sit on the couch while we were like putting things up around them. And I have, my producers have a couple of pictures of the two of them just like, Oh my God. And I think that helped them like feel a little bit more comfortable, um, because they saw, kind of the beginning to the end instead of just like walking into this big like setup kind of thing also that what you see on the film is not what my house looks like it is completely backwards actually we reversed one of the shots because I realized that we shot everyone on the right side of the frame and so trying to cut all that together was just a nightmare so I yeah if you look really closely at my dad in the interviews the books on the bookshelf behind him are backwards <laughs> secrets oh, <man. laughs> don't tell anyone um <laughs> exactly yeah, we'll fix it in post it was fixed in post exactly. you know yeah. we'll fix it in post but um so yeah it was a week and it it i didn't know exactly how much we needed um because i didn't know exactly what my parents were going to say we blocked off whole days to interview each person because i didn't want to us to feel rushed you know I I warned my crew I was like we're gonna buy the biggest memory cards we have and we're just gonna roll and roll and roll um and see what happens and so the I knew the film was done when we were filming with my brother and his toner went off and he jumped and ran and that was like my dream I mean obviously of course I don't want anyone to have an emergency that requires firefighters but when that happened, I was like, we're done. This is it. This is a sign. Yeah. Um, the movie's done. We had, we had made this whole plan. We had charts mapped out um, of how we were going to get out. Cause we had about 30 seconds to get out of that room with our setup. Um, so we had like my production sound recorder had like his boom, like threaded through all the lockers, wow. the grips had like rigged up these quick release light systems. <laughs> it was impressive. I couldn't tell you how it worked, but <laughs> they were like, they engineered the crap out of that setup. So we were out in 30 seconds. And anyway, so I was really excited to put that into practice. Um, and yeah, when that happened and they left and they just left us in the empty firehouse, we all kind of looked at each other and we were like, the movie's done. So I love it. That's amazing. <laughs> that you. ending was so good. Like I remember yeah. seeing that. Like, oh my God. Wow. <laughs> Powerful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. For team Maryland, it was a pretty long shooting process. It was about a year and a half of uh, shooting. Um, and it's kind of similar to what you were talking about of like, we didn't quite know like what our story was going to be. And it was more so just Gabe going out and like shooting a bunch of footage and then us regrouping and looking at it and like, you know, like him editing like scenes and then 
forming like where is this story going um and yeah originally it was supposed to stop at maryland going from third in the nation to first in the nation um and we were like okay i guess the the doc is done um and then gabe was like well maryland's going to the junior olympics he's like should i go out and shoot that i was like yeah you should go out and shoot that um he's like but it's like at the same time at all as all my finals at usc (laughs) And I was, and so he like managed to like reach out to all his professors, like postpone all his finals. I'm like, you need to tell them how important this is. Um, so <laughs> we were very passionate. Um, and, and yeah, I guess I think you can kind of feel it in the doc, um, like how long we spent with that family and like how well, especially Gabe really got to know them and really like integrate himself into their lives and like yeah I feel like for you Gabe they're like a second family now yeah I think one of the benefits of being like a student while shooting it um aside from ditching class which was nice was uh being young and like looking quite unintimidating uh when I was shooting with them because before I actually started shooting with Marilyn she had an ESPN spotlight for Hispanic Heritage Month And over that summer, uh, when I was like doing the phone call interviews and stuff, they had an entire team from ESPN come in to her home and and shoot. And it was like 10, a crew of like 10 people, like lights, boom pole, like sound dudes, director with a camera and uh, like two camera interview set up and everything. And then they all finished their project. And then I came in and I'm just this like, uh scrawny filipino kid with like a camera and like, like a dinky mic on top and you know we didn't use any lights uh no we had a lav uh only for the boxing scene in the ring uh otherwise all the audio everything was just from wherever i was standing and uh, i think that actually provided a ton of comfort for the family because it allowed me to to be pretty invisible uh and just like uh, try to disappear it was actually quite uh, of a spiritual filming process too, because many times, uh, and I remember being in the kitchen filming them and I would just close my eyes and then I would just breathe and I would listen to like the sounds going on around me. And I would try to like really envision myself as like being completely invisible. And I think, uh, I don't know if it really like made a difference or not, but for me, it just like allowed me to focus on being extremely present and just like existing in that space with them. Uh, and that was, yeah, that was, I think how we got so comfortable. And also, you know, I'm in, I'm in the same age range as like a potential child of theirs. And they really, they did see me and take me in as like a, as their younger son. That's how, that's how they treat me. And I see them as like a family. Uh, and so, yeah, that's kind of how we got comfortable with each other. That's beautiful, you guys. Oh my gosh. So we have a year and a half um, of filming. We have a week. And then uh, Claire and Alex, how, how long did you guys spend? Yeah, two days, two days. Wow. Yeah, that's like the beauty of documentaries is that you can, you know, like create the story with however amount of time that you have. Um, so I guess like since this is a little panel about documentaries, um, I wanted to, you know, like, have you guys talk about that? Like, what do documentaries mean to you? What do you hope that people take away from your stories, whether it's the stories that you're telling now or the stories you're planning on telling in the future? What, what's, what's, what's going on there? I do want to say before I, before we get to that, you, for Davis, like, you don't, I, it's crazy that you did that in two days because you don't feel like it's only two days at all. Like, it, it feels like much longer than that. I think it was the comfort that you had with the family or something. And also the amount of coverage that you have. Like, I was surprised to see him at the beach and then going to sleep. And I'm like, I was trying to calculate it in my mind as I was, as I was watching it. Like, okay, did they shoot this on night one or night two? Because there's only two moments they could have potentially filmed this, like, bedtime story at uh, when he did the Yo Mama joke. Yeah. 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 Uh, so congratulations on that because it, it felt like you had filmed way longer than two days. long it's it's funny they were packed luckily like they were the family was very down like day day one we got to their house probably around like 8 a.m i think because he had a soccer game that we wanted to get his like morning routine and then we left with them at like 8 30 
Um, but day two, we wanted to, there's like a sunrise shot, like towards the end, right before the beach. So our crew got up at like 5.35. Yeah. Yeah. And we're like, no, we're just going to do it. <laughs> we're like, we only have one day left. So we're just going to do that. And then we got up at like 5.30, got there, shot the sunset around like 6, 6.30. But, and the family gets up really early. Davis is a, quite an early riser. He's like their alarm clock. Um, so we were done shooting the sunset and we could like see through their house that they were all like moving and they were up and then they let us in. It was like seven in the morning and then we were there. So we're getting ready for the day. And then that same day, that was our last day. Um, we were there when they put Davis, um, to bed for the night. And then we stayed up with the family until like probably like 11 o'clock, 11, 12, um, talking with the parents, um, and with Jackson who they let like participate in their nightly conversations. Um, so yeah, it was packed and they they were like game for it all, which is really, really cool. Yeah. Uh, sorry, the question was, yeah, the question? Um, <laughs> what does documentary filmmaking mean to you? Yeah, what, what do you look forward to telling or like, what do you hope that folks, you know, take away from the stories that you're sharing with everyone? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, for us with Team Maryland, we just kind of wanted to share this, like, this, not only this moment in time, like this really special moment in time for Maryland, but also just like welcome people into this world they would have never otherwise seen or, or been a part of. Like, I feel like especially being that the family lives like in the projects in Watts, you know, like there are a lot of ideas and like, things out there of what that community is and feels like and so for us it was really really special to be welcomed into that world and see it through Marilyn's eyes like see the beauty in her home and feel the warmth and and brightness in their home um despite you know all that's going on like they're kind of desensitized at this point to like violence in their area um and, and we got to kind of like understand that and see that with them. So I think like that's something really special we wanted people to get out of this documentary was to see like the beauty of Marilyn's home through her eyes and the beauty of like her experience through her eyes. Um, and then for me personally, like with any like film or documentary that I make, I feel like um, it's really just about um, I feel like sharing a story that, yeah, we haven't quite heard before, or um, even just like, if it is a story maybe that we've heard before, like from a new angle or perspective. Um, yeah, that's kind of, I, I love real stories too, because I feel like it's just something you could never make up. Like, so even in narrative work, I, I love to kind of like pull from true stories. Yeah, I, I love the way you said that for what we wanted to get out, what, how we wanted to share the doc, like with the community of Watts. And then for me personally, I, I actually was not uh, like, uh, like trying to make a documentary um, before this. So we went to an arts-based high school and we focused mostly on narrative work. And so I was just making like narrative shorts. And then uh, it, it, my voice kind of, my biggest idea basically is to have an intention and then let the world manifest that intention. And I'll let the, the world take care of the details. And so in a lot of my narrative work, I really focused on family, uh, you know, with my experiences with my siblings, my mom, I have a lot of like stories and themes and uh, characteristics about myself that I'm passionate on putting on screen. And so that was my intention and meeting this family, they were like the outlet to allowing me to allow me to express express that. Uh, and so I would say just hone in on your voice and I think the subject will find you. We'll see what happens though. I think for me, documentary has always meant action, um, at least in the way that I approach documentaries, like whether it's in a, a very outward, straightforward way, call to action or not, um, I really, try to approach documentaries in a way that they inspire action. Um, so for fighters specifically, the action being, you know, check in with your loved ones. Being a firefighter is hard. They are heroes, but they are humans. Um, paramedics, heroes, 
and humans. And so, you know, it's, it's not telling you to go out and, you know, donate somewhere or anything like that. Equally fantastic documentaries though. Um, but my, my intention and my hope for this was to just have hope. My hope is that people who see the documentary take, just take a little moment to think about the people that you love in your life and the kind of toll that their work may be taking on them. Um, especially the people who may not work in roles that encourage you to talk about it in that way and encourage you to feel weakness and feel pain and um, work through it uh, in a vulnerable way, which I think famously is not something that is done in firehouses. Um, it is changing, it is growing. Um, my family was very kind to their fire district because they didn't want to lose their jobs. Um, but of course there is a lot of work to be done um, in these firehouses um, and in these professions to support the people that do these jobs um, because it is important work and it is not a job that we want to see people stop taking, um, but we want them to feel supported. And so any documentary I make now or in the future, um, I just hope that it's, it's one that can inspire actual tangible action um, because that is, documentary is something that I like to think that I know how to do. Um, and so hopefully it can be a positive contribution to the world in the way that I know how to do it best. Um, because I've always wanted to work I've always wanted to help people. I've always wanted to work, you know, but I just, I'm not built to be a doctor. I'm not built to be a nurse, caregiver, things like that. So my hope is that documentary can do something like that, even though it can't directly heal. Um, yeah, that's my answer. Thank you. Okay, I will say, uh, Megan, is um, watching your doc, one thing I thought was really interesting was kind of, yeah, that intergenerational trauma that was clearly there, especially between um, your grandfather and your father. And one thing I thought was really interesting was that in terms of talking about the next generation, both of them sound very hesitant in terms of like, you know, wanting kind of like their child to take on this job, especially in your dad's case. Um, and I thought that was a nice contrast to your brother who is absolutely just like, kind of had a more optimistic outlook and kind of talked about even changing that culture and leading forward like on a positive note for like especially in, like inclusivity and like having um you know like female firefighters and thing i thought that was really powerful um but yeah no i completely just to echo what you said um i think the great thing about at least for claire and i working on the stock was that you really feel like you're um a part of something that's like larger than you um because even just like filming davis it was a reminder that, you know, he's like one of thousands of kids who have uh, Kuhn de Vries syndrome and also Kuhn de Vries syndrome, the symptoms are like, like are often like confused with like being on the spectrum. And so there could also like probably thousands of other kids who are just undiagnosed. Um, and with that, when we were making the movie, we were talking about like, okay, Obviously, we have like our artistic intent of like wanting it to be about his family and like kind of this coming of age for Davis, but it's also about you know the disease and the science behind it and like figuring out a way to really communicate that for an audience. And um, we kind of like split down the middle and we're thinking of like you know, like for instance, Nifty is our like festival premiere, but before that, it um, in November, a uh, rough cut of the movie screened at a national health summit. Um, for like a bunch of scientists and researchers to like better understand the disease and Claire and I have constantly been talking about it where it's like we want to consider like okay you know when we apply to like film festivals it's to spread awareness and you know kind of like just get people like talking about it um, but like we also want to you know, consider submitting to like science journals or um, publications that could help like mobilize like actual efforts and scientists to like um you know get money towards research and um hopefully like move towards a cure or um ashley is like on a mission um it's really admirable just because like she does so much and you know obviously she's under a lot of uh, pressure she's like the head 
of like the KDVS Foundation. Um, and yeah, it's whenever we interviewed her, it's always like um, she really just wants like her son to get better and also like all the other kids to get better. And it's really admirable. And um, yeah, no, when we were interviewing her, she would get like, like we were in awe of how strong she was. Um, and there was only one moment when we were interviewing her that is in the movie where she does break for just a second and like gets emotional just talking about like, you know, this long journey she's been on and I'm sure we'll just continue, you know, for the rest of her life. Um, and yeah, just like moments like that were really like this film is, you know, not to be lofty, but it's definitely like, you know, we, we want it to be to reach people and, you know, um, like truly kind of help the effort and the cause. I think to um, Alex and I both come mostly from a narrative background. That's kind of what we went. We both dabbled in documentary before, but our kind of education is in narrative. Um, and, but I do think as we are kind of, we've mentioned this as we were approaching kind of the way we were going to make the movies, we wanted to make it. Um, I mean, we shot quite cinematically. We shot on anamorphic lenses and um, we kept Davis as like our protagonist. And I do think, I think people sometimes have a tendency to like see documentary is not the most approachable. It's like, oh, I don't really want people like just dumping information on me. I'd rather just kind of um, narratives a bit, sometimes more people at least perceive it as a little bit more easy to digest. And so by shooting it slightly more cinematically and as a film, it's kind of for the general audience approach of like, we just want people to know what this is. Um, I think kind of our hope is, you know, people can feel like they're watching a movie and at the same time come out of it with something, some new information um, and a new sort of awareness. I think jumping off of that, that's like you were saying about screening with like in, in the health industry and in the health sector, um, there's something really powerful and beautiful about telling real human stories and presenting them in an educational way, like you said, um, to professionals, to scientists, researchers, people really behind the cause, similar to Fighter, that was kind of my intention. I was like, well, if I don't get into any film festivals, I will give it, you know, it can be played at fire departments and things like that. And I think that's really important for like any kind of career-based or industry-based documentary or cause-based documentary to have those public screenings alongside film festivals, you know, to share it with folks who may not seek them out at a film festival, but may stand to learn a lot. And I think that's, that's really great to hear that you, you've you screened it in places like that. And I hope it continues out there. Yeah, Megan, I was gonna ask you, cause you're saying like a goal is to enact change with the movie. Since I, like, I'm very unfamiliar with that world. Do you have an idea of kind of like where it would go and like, like how, where do you screen to enact change within the firefighting community? What does that look like? Yeah. Uh that's a good question. Um, I mean, I'm slowly learning more. So, I mean, my dad has been begging me for going on a year now to just post the film so he can share it with his firefighter friends. Cause every time he mentions it, they're like, that sounds really interesting. I've never heard of something like that. And they want to, they want to be part of that conversation. So I think, you know, the surface level answer is fire school, yeah. you know, recruiting offices, things like that um, is definitely an important part place where they would be played. Would they play it? I don't know. Would fire school leaders play it? Um, a film about how hard and damaging the film, the industry is maybe, maybe not. Um, but more broadly, there are, there are foundations that exist um, in Canada. There's the Canadian foundation for fallen firefighters. I think they have um, websites, they have social media, they have events. So foundations like that, I think, are really important um, to essentially provide the documentary with. Like, this is the last um, festival for this documentary, and I think that's somewhere where I'd like it to go, um, to engage people with foundations like that. They provide scholarships um, for children who've lost their parents on the job. Um, they provide really spousal support and family support for people who um, love firefighters and have a firefighter in their family. So I think places like that are really good places to essentially offer up the documentary and say, if you want this as an educational tool on your social media, anywhere, go for it. And hopefully it inspires a chat 
or something positive. Yeah. Yeah. Now, also, I had a quick question for you too. Like, now that it's been a, like a while since you made the piece, what's your brother's experience like uh, being a firefighter? Has have you noticed any changes in him? Yeah. I mean, I haven't. I haven't been home a lot, but I have heard he's had some tough calls. Um, there is a mental health epidemic happening, and firefighters are first on scene for those. Um, for mental health calls, especially in rural community where he works. So he has had some really, really challenging calls, but I think, honestly, I think making this film got him thinking and kind of reminded him that your dad is there, you can talk to him. And that's exactly what he did. You know, he had a really, really horrible call. Um, and that was the first thing he did. He called his dad and he said, I don't want to go home right now. I'm leaving the station. I don't know where to go. I'm coming to you. And my dad made a bunch of food and they had a big talk. And I think it was really great. I mean, he still wants to be a firefighter. He is still volunteering. Yeah, he's a volunteer firefighter. He's not a career firefighter. Um, he wants to be. Um, and I think it's really great to see him still answer the call. And, you know, he's he's only two years in, but he's he wants to be there and he wants to help people. And I think that, you know, from the, you know, fresh newbie kind of naive kid on the screen to now, I think the one thing that hasn't changed is his like burning desire to be there, to be the first on scene and to be the face that someone sees when they're having a really, really bad day. So, so he's doing great. <laughs> Um, gang, really quick, how much time do we have left? If uh, uh, 10 minutes? Okay, awesome. Um, I did want to have the audience hopefully ask you guys some questions, but before we get to that, are there any like, I don't know, final questions that you folks have for each other? I, I hate to, you know, I, I love seeing the, the sparks kind of shooting between you all. I don't think so. Just like, Wow, good job, guys. Yeah, <laughs> it's been really cool to watch your stuff. Yeah. That was that was fun. I, I <laughs> yeah, I really lost myself in our conversations here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, the light is kind of aha. Uh -huh, if I do that, it helps. Okay, yeah. Wait, you know what? I'm gonna walk up to you with this mic. Hang on. We're gonna do like a Disney World moment, you know. <laughs> um, so you guys talked about uh, finding your story through the filming process. Um, but I'm just wondering, uh, especially with documentary, I feel like, you know, you kind of find your story twice, like once while filming and then once in post and while you're editing it. Um, so what was your editing process like? And, um, yeah, how did you find that, that structure that you, that you put on screen and, and really that story, how did that come out through editing? Yeah, Thank you. I know. um, for us with team Maryland, it was like scene by scene, um, Gabe would kind of like cut these scenes together um and then we'd kind of like figure out how we're gonna yeah shape this narrative out of it um and for us I think the biggest challenge was like incorporating Marilyn's past medical trauma with her present rise in the ranks in boxing um and so something we really talked about a lot was like making this a dual narrative so you kind of like see her rise in boxing and like at the same time you slowly gradually hear about her recovery from her injury um and we didn't know also like what visuals to put on screen for her injury um and so we kind of landed on like showing like visuals of watts in the community to kind of like juxtapose like you know even though we don't know what caused this disease like it is said to they think it's an environmental sickness. So just kind of juxtaposing the beauty in her community, but also the fact that that um, her environment may be like the cause of her sickness. Um, so we tried to kind of show like kind of beautiful shots of Watts as the parents are recounting the story and like what happened to her. Um, but yeah, you wanna speak to that more? That was beautifully said. Yeah, so um, I think there are a few elements that we learned about editing in this process too. Um, I think the first one is organization, which sounds really boring, but 
it is like it played an, a huge role in like getting us to be able to cut this thing because we did have like you know footage that spanned a year and a half and being able to document and like notate you know and mark everything so we knew where all the footage was we also like i worked with julia and and our friend jason as well as screenwriters so in addition to the organization there's like the element of storytelling uh, as a screenwriter and working with them they're like some of the most talented screenwriters that i know and what we did was a uh, log all of the shooting days and we put events under each day and then we assigned each event to potential themes like oh this event seems like it pertains to, to the immigrant experience or to like working together as a family and then we stitched together an outline and that outline was like what we used to help like cut the cut the documentary um, and then the third thing was just me realizing that editing, I, being like an artist is kind of like being an athlete. I see athleticism and artistry as having like uh, the same journey a little bit or same mental conversations you have to have with yourself because Marilyn trains for months just for three rounds in the ring. And for us, it's like we put in so much energy and work into this thing and it's going to be immortalized, immortalized on the screen for like 27 minutes, you know. Uh, so knowing that you got to keep going and sometimes you're going to show up and it's not going to be amazing when you train or when you edit. But every day does count because when it's time to show up, it's going to, you know, the proof is going to be in the pudding. Kudos for putting together a year and a half's worth of footage um, into a documentary because that is, I know that's no small task. So congrats on that. And also 27 minutes was the runtime. I wanted so much more than that. <laughs> like it was really, really well put together. Congrats. Um, for me, I think, so the home movies really helped structure that, I think. Um, getting those digitized one by one uh kind of helped me kind of put together my story because it was really scary so we drove from Toronto Ontario to Nova Scotia which is approximately an 18 hour drive and we did it in January so generously it's more than 18 hours um so driving back with all the footage with no kind of all I knew is we were going to end with the call I didn't know anything else um and that really scared me, I think. And I think grounding myself, spending hours and hours watching old home movies really helped because it helped me pull out beats from my past that tie to what was said in the present. Um, especially if you've seen the film, there is a moment um, on Christmas morning in the home movies where we're unwrapping uh, a little raincoat that looks like a firefighter's outfit. And you know, my dad's going, look, it's just like when daddy wears. And so, for much of my childhood, my dad would set up the video camera on Christmas morning and record the whole thing. So these were like two hours long. And so I watched about six years of Christmases, two hours each. And that one took a while to find. But when I found it, I was like, all right, here's here's the story. Here's, you know, I, I think I was by myself in my apartment. I, I was yelling, like, yeah. because I just, that was the moment where I was like, okay, here's the story. And I think that really helped. And also transcripts. Um, I tried, I had a binder, um, of all of my transcripts and that was really helpful to physically cut and highlight and paste. And I think that's where the story really came together was those home movies and those transcripts. Um, because yeah, like going into it, like you guys were saying, I didn't know what the story was going to be and I didn't really know what it was going to be even after we wrapped. So that was helpful for sure. Um, very, it's, well, it's crazy because, I mean, a weekend of footage felt like a lot, but I can imagine a year and a half. Um, we also re relied quite heavily on our transcripts. Um, we had a deadline, like when we were screening our rough cut for the National Health Summit, we had to get them a cut in like, I think it was like two or three weeks or something after shooting. It was very, very quick. Um, so we actually had two editors who worked on our project because um, our first one had scheduling conflicts and she had to go to another shoot. So um, we brought on our second editor, Brendan, was like our first AD um, while on set, which was like really, really helpful because he was he saw everything as it unfolded. Um, but it was really cool because our first editor, Kirsten, had totally fresh eyes. So it was like she came in, laid the groundwork with fresh eyes, and then Brendan came in and knew the dynamic we had with the family and the family had among each other um, and then added that element. 
Um, but when we were still in North Carolina, we were like preparing footage to get it to her first editor. Um, so she could start working while we were shooting. And then Alex and I were like on the plane flying back, like highlighting transcripts and like sending it off to our editor being like, here's what we think is valuable. Um, so there was a lot of overlap between production and post um, that really helped like smooth out the process. Um, I think one of our kind of editing through lines is we always knew that we didn't want to end on a negative note. We didn't want to end on a sad note um, because Davis is a child. And when you see the world through his eyes, it's, it's still very bright and it's, there's so much excitement to the world. And so we wanted to make sure that we captured that and kind of had this theme of like his, his disease does not define his youth. Um, so regardless of how the movie kind of played out in like the middle, we just knew always that like it was going to end on a very positive, very positive message and moment. Yeah. I also just want to, um really give kudos to claire because she didn't mention this but um when we were done filming so i i'm based in new york so i flew back to new york and she flew back to la with the drives i had like maybe like half the dailies on um like a drive i had but really like primarily post was going to be kind of like um just done in la and um, a lot of times it was like me zooming in and, you know, there's like a three hour time difference and Claire uh, doesn't get off work till like six and then wouldn't get like, we wouldn't start at like seven the earliest. So it was like, we, we, it was grateful. I was grateful because we kind of split them up into like four to five hour sessions. So, um, you know, I got to like go over kind of the stuff she would like FaceTime me in and she would show me the timeline and things like that and um uh yeah I would always just weigh in but still like it's just so different not being in the space and I think Claire just deserves a like a lot of praise <laughs> because like you know I I do think when it came to post Claire um definitely like took the lead on that um you know um she did a great job at like making me like feel included because it's just hard because you know it's like I remember our mixing session was like difficult just because like I'm literally on a laptop and the thing is everything's just coming through like my really crappy laptop speakers so it's like she'd be like Alex how's that how does that sound and I'd be like I, I think it sounded okay <laughs> like I can't tell like the panning at all like I'm just like yeah no I think yeah, but it's like I trust Claire so much and I knew because like when we we're working on it like even whenever we had like, cause there, there would be times where we like disagreed on things, but it was never like a point of conflict. And Claire always says it's because we're both non-confrontational people. Mm -hmm. But I also think it's just because like, you know um, we both like respect each other's work. Um, we're friends. And like, whenever we had like a disagreement, it literally would just be like, we would state our case as to like why we think it should be one way. And then usually like we just find like common ground or the other person would be like, oh no, that makes a lot more sense. Like, yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, no, I, I will say like, it was weird at first, but we really picked up like a pace and um, just like really happy the way it turned out. Yeah. That's awesome. You guys, I literally cannot believe it is 10 a.m. <laughs> What the hell? I could sit and listen to you guys talk all day. Um, I hate to cut this short, even though we're a little three minutes over time, but Claire, Alex, Megan, Gabe, Julia, thank you so much for your dedicated hard work. Thank you for being here today. And thank you for providing this like beautiful window into you know these people's lives. And it's a time capsule and for your family as well, Megan. So congrats, you guys. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. Thank you.